Hello fellow freaks, geeks, and normies. This is my first ever random gaming stories of the week or weeks. This is basically where I'm going to be going over the game stuff that interests me and some of my opinions on some of the news that has been released and of potential products that have been released and, and things like that. So uh, without further ado, we will get started. We're going to be starting with the DualSense Edge for the PlayStation 5. It was just released this past week or so ago. It comes with a carrying case, connector housing, swappable stick modules and swappable stick caps, function keys for preset control files and adjusting chat versus the game volume uh, on the fly, two paddles, and it features adjustable trigger lengths as well. I did watch a teardown of the controller itself and it surprisingly was of super, super high quality. Uh, I would say um, I've watched a handful of teardown videos of controllers and, and things like that and it seemed like it was a pretty beefy build. It had a lot of metal parts where people would usually use plastic or another cheaper part, but almost all of the major connecting points were were metal. So it does have a really premium feel, um, or at least it should. I, I, haven't, I don't have one myself, but I, I imagine it should. Uh, that does make it a little bit heavier as well. And there's a big talking point between this controller because um, not many people, I would say, as far as the review people go, like the controller. At least they're dinging it for this one thing. And I understand where they're coming from, but I don't agree with giving it a negative review or at least a as a con for this sort of thing. And what I'm talking about is the small battery. So if you're not aware, the controller itself will really only last three to five hours, I, I believe. It's actually, the battery itself is smaller than what's in the DualSense 5, like physically smaller, and doesn't hold as much of a charge. But to that, I, I honestly just say, who cares? Uh, this isn't for those people who are playing unplugged on their couch, on their 5,000 inch TV with massive input delay. These are the people who are sitting two inches away from their screen and always playing hardwired so that there's little to no input delay. And for those people, they don't need that three to five hour charge. They're going to be plugged in all the time. So to me, I don't think that that's a bad thing. This is catered for those highly competitive gamers. And I think that Sony took that compromise because they knew that, that that's what their target audience was. It was for those highly competitive people who will play plugged in regardless. So to me, not that big of a deal. It's just a thing. Next up, we have E3 and some news regarding that. So the past couple of days, they did say that there will be no major console presence. And what that means is that there's no Microsoft, no Sony, and no Nintendo. To me, I think that I probably could have seen this coming up. It, it does kind of suck, but... I think that we're sort of chasing this feeling of nostalgia. You know, I, I think if you're watching this channel, you are probably like me in the sense that it was super cool as a, a viewer of it just to see all the big conferences from all the major consoles. You know, Nintendo would have their big reveal. Sony would have their console reveal. Xbox would have something crazy too. And all of that just happened back to back to back. Unfortunately, that's not a time that we live in anymore. Everyone will release their videos whenever they want to, their pre-recorded info dump of all this stuff that they want to get out and their plans for the next year or so. And I think that that is a fine thing. I don't really have an issue with it. Um, There's no E3 last year and we did get something in Summer Games Fest, right? So Summer Games Fest did have a decent showing. Personally, I thought it was, it was fine. And they actually had like a decent in-person like game trial venue. They had Sonic Frontiers there and that, that was that made for some pretty good content for some of the creators out there who were able to go to that and stuff on Street Fighter 6 like they had they had some stuff there so I thought that that was pretty cool for Summer Games Fest but regarding that I'm not sure I wasn't obviously there to be part of this whole thing but from what I gather there were no long lines 
to get to play any of these games. I think you had to sign up for a time or two to actually play through these things. So it, it, it was more managed, right? And I think that was a thing for E3 on the show floor as well, but it was also, you know, for normies like me and I would have to wait in a line for like eight hours and that's the only thing I do for the day. Uh, I did go to E3 once and that was the kind of the experience was a oh, long line for this game, long line for that game, long line for whatever. I don't I don't really think it's too much of a of a miss that we're going to be not having E3 the way we remember it. Regardless, I don't even know if E3 is necessary in general. Uh, it might be for the people in the business to, you know, rub elbows with each other and talk shop about certain things. But for, uh, again, normies like me and maybe you, you know, it's it's not something that we can take advantage of fully. The ESA in general, though, is even controversial themselves. Like, I, I think recently they said that they don't think that preservation of older games is necessary, which is kind of insane to me. And I get that they might be anti-piracy, but from from that statement, I assume that they don't condone emulating things and and stuff like that. So, you know, how else are people going to experience certain games, especially when things are out of production or whatever? It's just a bad look in general. In general, I don't think that E3 is necessary. They have, like Sony has their state of play, Nintendo has their direct, and now Xbox has their developer directs. And those I think suffice for what they need to do and people get hype off them anyway it's you know that that's what we want anyway as a consumer that's what I would want myself as a consumer I just watch the stuff and say cool that's that's a cool game cool shadow drop cool whatever I don't need the whole presentation of people being fake (laughs) I don't know yeah I mean with Summer Games Fest and all major consoles finding success in pre-recorded info dumps I ask, why do we even need an E3 right now? Now, this is where I get selfish and talk about stuff or events in games that I enjoy. So these, this will kind of be like a quick shot of certain things. A lot of it has to do with multiplayer stuff. So if you don't play multiplayer games, then sorry, Uh, but I'm going to go into a multiplayer thing now. So one game that I'm playing that is ongoing is Marvel Snap, and they just released a friendly battle mode and a balance update. I have not tried the friendly battles just yet. Everyone works on odd schedules, including myself, so it's hard to find time to play with my friends who actually do play Snap at a, um, you know, more, I don't want to say competitive, but more than casual manner. And they also, again, did some balance updates. Biggest one worth mentioning is, I think they actually only had two major balance updates, was Leader, who was nerfed. It's hard to kind of explain if you don't play the game, but Leader was kind of a... uh, an annoying pick because he would essentially just play all of what the opponent played but on whoever played its side. I know that sounds weird. You know, he gets to use whatever the opponent uses but on his side. Now it's more situational in that he only plays what was played to the location to his right. So that's, again, very situational, but it can make for some pretty good, interesting plays. Wolverine got a buff, uh, which was appreciated because I do have a really nice Wolverine card. Now he gets plus two on destruction. And uh, yeah, that was a much needed buff. He used to just like go to a random location for, for funsies. And now he actually gets plus two. So you can destroy him multiple times and get more power each time he gets destroyed, which is nice. So there's Marvel Snap. Uh, next up, we have Overwatch, which I play a lot. I did complete their uh, battle passes, uh, both the first and second battle pass all the way to level 200. It officially sort of stops at 80. <laughs> so anything past that, you just get like titles. So I, I did get like the level 200 title because I'm a nerd. Anyway, Overwatch had a balance update where they ruined the tank that I main, which was Roadhog, which is fine. I totally get it. Roadhog was a one-shot machine and kind of annoying to play against, but now he's essentially useless. So um. I am disappointed, but it's whatever. Uh, they barely touched the people who needed to get the largest nerfs, who were Sojourn and Kiriko, who I do play both of them. I They, they should kind of get, I don't want to say reworked, but they should get looked at more. Sojourn still kind of dominates games, and Kiriko's kit is just too strong, I mean, to even just like let go. She just heals so much still even though they reduce the time between when you can heal. Ramatra's alt remained unchanged so far. 
I believe that they are going to be changing it in the next update when the next season drops, which is next Tuesday. So at high level play, because Ramacha's ultimate remained unchanged, people can get stuck. Again, this is only at high level, <laughs> can get stuck in what they call the stare meta. And that means that they are just looking into each other's eyes for minutes on end. Because Ramacha's ult, if you're not familiar with his ultimate, can last literally forever as long as there's an enemy inside his field of uh, of ultimate. So that's, you know, a thing, and they are going to fix that, so good on them. But it just hasn't happened yet. They are, though, reintroducing credits, which is super awesome. This is something that I thought was super lame that they took away and forced people to buy stuff, especially the old skins, or at least only given the one choice to buy old skins with actual currency. But now they are reintroducing the credit system where you can earn 1500 from the battle pass for free and get an extra 500 credits in the premium battle pass. So you can get a total, if you buy the battle pass, 2000 credits, which can then unlock a skin or two. You can finally buy the old skins instead of paying for a skin that was released six years ago. Now, we go into the FGC. If you're unfamiliar with what the FGC means, it means the fighting game community. So, in the FGC news, the Tekken World Tour starts this weekend. This is the final event of the year for Tekken 7. Uh, technically, uh, obviously, it's the beginning of the year, but they, they have their final thing in February for, for some reason. This one is held in Amsterdam, which means early matches for good old North American viewing. Something that I'll probably just watch uh, a VOD of, you know, as it the, the day it happens, but hours later. This is possibly the last Tekken World Tour for Tekken 7. And that's mainly because I anticipate a release of Tekken 8 by this time next year, which I assume will then have Tekken World Tour for Tekken 8. My prediction is at this event, they will release a demo of Tekken 8 where you can play as four characters or something which would be super awesome if they did that that's my highest of high hopes that they release a demo of Tekken 8 and with regard to the players who are in the event I myself am rooting for Anakin or need to win it all but it's hard to say who will take it the next thing up is Frosty Faustings this is the one that has like all the games. They even have Tekken 7 there, but um, I'm not too excited for that because obviously the best Tekken players are going to be in Amsterdam. So this will just kind of be uh, kind of just, <laughs> I don't know, a fun little run for the people who didn't make it to the Tekken World Tour. So this one has, you know, games like Smash Ultimate, Street Fighter V, again, Tekken 7. But I think the main event this time around is going to be Guilty Gear Strive, which I believe that was a main event at evo last year too yeah guilty gear strive is a game that i want to get into but i haven't found time to get into but the big news from this one actually is that the top two players of the king of fighters 15 will actually be flown out to evo japan to compete so this is like news that dropped i think yesterday or two days ago now you know the, the players had no idea that this was a thing so now people are going to try super hard to win at least or uh, at least to try to get to the top two so that they can go to evil japan in march again the guilty gears drive finals are the kind of big thing to watch and in general i'm looking forward to seeing some guilty gears drive play and some street fighter 5 play i would say i'd be excited for tekken but again all the best players are in amsterdam so whatever that concludes today's episode of what do i call it <laughs> random random things and games random game stories of the week yeah that's what i that's what i called it but yeah if you liked the content please like subscribe and leave a comment down below of the things some some of your thoughts on the things that i had mentioned today we went over the dual sense controller and people getting butt hurt about the small battery the e3 having no major console presence at all marvel snapped updates overwatch updates and fgc stuff if you want to catch me live i will be streaming on twitch sunday through wednesday generally in the evening except for on tuesdays i will be on during the daytime but that's all i got so I'll see y'all in the next one.